This is Brad Pitt. You'll be hearing commentary on the film Seven by uh, production designer Arthur Max, our illustrious director David Fincher, Rob Bottin, our uh, uplifting writer Andrew Walker, and uh, of course the great Morgan Freeman and myself. This is Morgan Freeman. I had a dinner with David Fincher because I didn't know him. We hadn't met, and so we met in Los Angeles for dinner, and we sat for a couple of hours. And he just—he's such an intellect, <laughs> such an arrogant intellect. He just thrilled me. Early in life, when you're dreaming about becoming a success in the movies, so what types of characters do you want to play? And uh, this was one of mine to play a a uh, police detective whose gift was cerebral, who was not necessarily uh, action oriented. And so here was my perfect opportunity. Here was uh, Somerset. who was this deep thinker, this voracious reader with uh, instant recall. Arthur Max. It, it, it was meant to be now, somewhere in America, but not a specific where, and a hybrid between a modern city and a city kind of echoing Cities of, you know, images of cities that we've seen in film noir and really kind of retro feeling to the world, but, a, you know, a kind of something in between. Now, it's, of course, it's not raining. I mean, we're filming in L.A. But yeah, for me, I would never know it. They filmed in beautiful downtown Los Angeles and just constant rain machines. We had the rain machines going any time we were outside. You know, that rusty, stale, uh, hepatitis-carrying water, you know? We did go to uh, elaborate lengths to kind of keep L.A. out, um, even uh, to the extent of recoding the street graphic colors at uh, bus stops and no parking lines, uh, changing as often as possible uh, logos on vehicles, taxi cabs, sanitation trucks. Uh, inventing the police uh, vehicles from their logos to their color schemes. Anything that was L.A. was forbidden. The culture um, reflected in this world was really trying to portray society at its worst. And the world we lived in was a dark and decaying one, frequented by... Uh, things that were constantly not working correctly, things that were breaking, breaking down, people arguing on streets, uh, encounters, uh, unpleasant ones. It was not a fun place. David Fincher. The opening of the film in the original script, the opening of the film in, I think, all the drafts of the script was Somerset buying a sort of run-down little house in the country. And he takes out a switchblade and he cuts a little square of the wallpaper. This little square of wallpaper becomes his reminder of what it is, where he's going and what his goal is. And he um, carries it with him throughout the whole movie. And, uh, and eventually in preview screenings, it was decided. <laughs> it was decided that the opening was too slow and, and needed to be accelerated. And then we had sort of two problems, like what do we start the movie with and now what do we do with the title sequence? And so that's when the new title sequence, that's when we decided to inject dough somewhere into the first reel. If we could do it under the titles, at least we would kind of get people, we could do something a little bit disturbing, a little unsettling that would tide them over until, of course, we got to the gluttony murder, rattle their cages a little bit. It was obvious that in a way we wanted in the first five minutes to let the audience know that this was not Legends of the Fall. <laughs> if that's what they were expecting, that they were in the wrong theater. I had this idea for a video years ago. I wanted to do a, a music video that looked like a film that Fritz Lang or, or David Griffith 
It looked like a film that had been made at the turn of the century. I wanted to do a video that had that kind of feel of like old crank cameras, old Bell and Howell 2709s, and you know, this kind of hand cranked, funky, exposure flickering, black and white, old uncoated Baltar lenses. And I wanted to shoot it with the idea of incorporating really state of the art computer visual effects. Kyle came up with the idea when we were looking for a temp title sequence. Well, let's see Doe's books. You know, we spent thousands of dollars on these books and you just sort of, they just sort of flash by in a couple of scenes. And so what, what if we saw his books really close up? We saw how meticulous his writing was and all the weird things that, and all, the, all of his little cutouts and his little preversions. It's, it was an homage to Stan Brackage and Norman McLaren and people like that who saw film as a, the actual plastic as part of the experience as opposed to what it could record, what it could contain, you know, it's like not only that, but what could you sew to it, you know, what could you stitch to it and glue to it and scratch with sand. And so to me, it sort of pictorially represented aberrant thinking, you know, it was like a way to actually see on the screen aberrant thought. My aesthetic has always been sort of tied to the Gordon Willis's of the world, the Jordan Cronenworth, the the Conrad Halls, the the you know James Wong Howes, the the people who took risks. And the story became the context for the lighting, and the lighting helped create the context for the story at the same time. And so you're looking for the people who. Um, you know, it's a, it's an innate thing. I don't know how to, um, you know, Darius has this, he has this, uh, he, he has a, an emotional response to light and scene, you know, and, uh, and so I've tried desperately to, we went way out of our way to get him to shoot the movie because I, you know, he's a, he's kind of more known in Paris as being a sort of a fashion, you know, French perfume cinematographer. You know, he's done a lot of that kind of stuff. But I thought if you take that sensibility and his sensitivity and turn it and unleash it on a cop movie, there's going to be something in there that's going to be different. We were looking for a kind of design to the film that was a no-color concept in the sense that it wasn't really a black and white movie but the movie was the color of the film was very controlled and accented so the palette of the film was very limited what we did was a lot of smoking over and darkening and taking color down and trying to darken the world that we lived in both for psychological reasons and also for photographic reasons because they were doing a kind of silver enhancement process, which tend to be a, a kind of bleaching of the film, which tend to lighten colors dramatically and also enrich the contrast of the film. So we had to very carefully control the density and the value of a lot of the work that we were doing. Uh, there's a nice feel in the gluttony murder scene when they come in through the back door and they're sort of get letting the water fall off their raincoats and then they turn and they sort of walk in and there's a wonderful sense of your eyes adjusting to darkness. I used to work a lot with Jordan Cronenworth and he's one of these people who kind of found a place where you can expose color negative film that incorporates not only recording the image but also creating, it's like a veil. There's a place where you can expose color negative. We actually see the grain react differently to highlights as it does to shadow. When you're exposing film in what's called the toe of the film, that is to say way right down where exposure starts to disappear, where you begin to lose people into shadows, and where you begin to lose actual detail, you can get this patina it's like watching a print of an old movie. If you're exposing properly, if you're exposing dangerously, you can print the film to maximize this tactile quality. It, it, has, a, it has a kind of life of its own. Andy Warhol killed this man.
I mean, one of the photographers that uh, that Darius and I really talked about a lot was um, Robert Frank, who who you know sh- shot everything with available light, you know. And so there are things in his work, you know, there are shots of bar rooms where there's a piece of neon that's five stops, six stops, seven stops overexposed from where everything else is, or a jukebox, and the and the lights are. Mm. Are blooming out of it, and the, and the and the film itself can't contain, can't deal with that much light. It's actually causing, it's actually causing exposure in the areas where the the neon tube isn't. It's actually eating into it, and and there's this kind of little battle that goes on just photochemically when you begin to play at those kinds of exposure levels, and you begin to see Brad exposure wise in the flashlight you know it's like when the flashlight comes up it pluses the exposure and the shadow side around it and you can just make him out and there's kind of throughout that scene where he's got his flashlight into his clipboard and the light is coming up from it under you know, under lighting him which is really beautifully handled by Darius and all that stuff totally necessitates that the actor hold the flashlight in the right place the right distance from their face and Brad's not only reading the lines and hitting his marks, but he's also lighting himself the whole time. You know, we built as much of the set as we could afford to build, and you see every inch of it. This place smelled bad. And the food was left to rot in there. When Brad finds the bucket of vomit underneath it, it's filled, the bucket itself was filled with ammonia, you know, so his eyes do water when he stands up. You know what I mean? It was, we did a lot of work. That's what you gotta give to actors. You gotta steep them in this. You think it's poison? Oh, wonderful. Very moody. You think it's poison, Tumberstone? Bob had to sit there for days with his face in plate of spaghetti, basically breathing through a hole that was that ran through the bowl, through the table, and uh, out the other end. Cockroaches crawling all over him. <laughs> Sweet man. What I tried to do with this movie was say, what's going to give me the most visceral effect? What is the point of view, the context for this material that's going to give me the most visceral effect? I was thinking about the television show Cops, just how immediate this was that you would have a guy with an ENG camera in the back seat of a car and these guys would be telling you, you know, about they'd be driving around on their watch or their beat or whatever, and they'd be talking about stuff, and you sort of see the backs of their heads. And I started thinking, well, there's something very powerful about the backs of people's heads when they don't have the time to actually turn and face you and tell you what's on their mind, that you overhear what it is that they're saying, or they throw it over their shoulder. And I started thinking, well, it's also we're sort of tagging along. That's kind of Mill's point of view. And it's also the kind of the way that we would, if we were really forced into this situation, how we would view Somerset. Rob Botin. This is a complete replica of Bob Mack. We actually had to mold him from head to toe using a prosthetic grade silicone. We actually had to do him in pieces. We couldn't actually do it all in one sitting. So we molded Bob's head on one day, his two arms on another day, his torso on another day, and each leg on a separate and individual day. The autopsy scene in this was, I loved because I just loved how matter of fact it was. These guys, here was this guy and he was going to be lying there, just naked as can be. And Rob Bottin came to me and he said, you know, I'm going to make you an autopsy victim that you'll be proud of. And I said, go deep, man, just go. When we were done shooting, Brad Pitt wanted to buy the fiberglass body and use it at the wrap party, cut it open, and put bean dip in it. Initially, Fincher thought that he actually didn't want to see Bob Mack's face, that he just wanted to see his body. And then I I called uh, Fincher and I said, man, you know, this Bob Mack guy's got a brilliant face. You know, it's very cherubic, you know, and uh, uh, he actually has kind of a very pleasant face. So I said, I think that it really adds a haunting uh, quality to go ahead and, um, you know, show it. It became very obvious in the first read through that we had cast the perfect guys for these parts, that 
You know, here was Morgan who was, I will take these lines and I will make them work for me. Hey man, here's the thing. I've been out in the rain all day. This is beginning. We've got one day. And that was the Somerset kind of approach. Tell me where to go and what to do and I will do my thing within those confines. And then there was <laughs> Brad on the other end saying, this is just not... This needs more something. It's just how about if I do this? And what if I go over here and I, and what if I'm, you know, and, you know, he came up with a lot of, I mean, the first read through, he, he came up with the Marquis de Chardet thing. That was like, that was an instantaneous. I mean, everybody just cracked up and fell over. And Morgan was just, you know, wheezing practically with laughter over in the corner. And that just, that was instantly in the script. Too soon for it. Hey man, you know, I'm right here. You can say that shit to my He just face. bounces off furniture and, you know, it's very physical. You know, he's constantly perched on a windowsill smoking a cigarette and then, then he's like standing over on the on the on the tables or or walking around and, you know, laying on a couch and reading and tearing pages out. You know, he's just much more and you know, he's very mills, you know, he's very kind of frustrated with the whole um, with reading it, you know, it's like, well, let's go do it. Let's go stand up and act it. And Morgan was back, you know, with his glasses perched on his the bridge of his nose, kind of turning pages and saying, yeah, I can, this, I'll be fine with this. And I'm going to take a few of these lines out and, you know, I can do this much simpler. And this, you, you don't need me to say this. I'll just give him a look. <laughs> Richard Roundtree, Shaft. We all got a kick out of that. That was a little uh, personal experience right there I drew from. Reporters, paparazzi chasing you down, so forth. You know, they stuck this gold tooth in his mouth, and uh, he, had a, he had a tough time enunciating with it. David Fincher. I was very... Uh kind of confused in the in the 80s in the mid 80s when it became it became obvious that that violence was um, was going in this direction where it was becoming less and less what it is which is chaotic and destructive and and uh in some cases horribly sad and in other cases you know uh unbelievably stupid and and that violence was becoming an excuse it was replacing drama i think it's very important for a filmmaker to announce their thesis i think that uh um if I have a thesis, it is that um, if I'm going to make movies with violence in it, the violence is going to be real. It's not going to be. Uh, it's not going to be the drama in the movie. That's George Christie of The Good Life and The Hollywood Reporter, scraping the paint off the windows. Have you heard the news? Nope, haven't heard. Eli Gould was found. Morgan Freeman. The surface of, uh, of, of, of Somerset was that this is going to go on whether I'm here or not. Uh, we're not going to, as a, as, a, as a force for right and truth and justice, we're, we're, not, we're only going to sort of keep ourselves from drowning. Could you not do that, please? That is, you are your back is to the sea, and the best you can do is sort of maintain, but you won't be able to make any serious inroads uh, in terms of combating uh, crime, the criminal and intent, the criminal mind. Um, That's the whole idea. The moral center of the movie, of the story, is 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 the Somerset character, and uh, although he professes not to. Uh, uh, to be well now he's 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 at a point now where he's uh, tired and ready to retire. So uh, it legitimizes him in a way to say that apathy is a legitimacy, is legitimate, and he can understand apathy. And maybe that's what's driving him now, a, a growing sense of of what's the use. Uh, although now it's very clear to him, it always has been clear him to him what the use is. You know? 
Oh, uh, the coroner sent this down for you. Uh, and that's that's the moral center of the whole story. That yeah, you're gonna you're gonna people like John Doe are going to surface, and someone always has to be there to with a net. You know. The locations that we used and the sets that we built were often interwoven in the sense that the exteriors that we found and to establish the scene then led us to the design of the interior, uh, trying to bring the uh, real location to the studio as seamlessly as possible. The other things we did were discuss the, uh, the broad concepts of the world that we were trying to create together. And uh, David wanted a world that was neither a modern functioning realistic world uh, and not really a world that was uh, one of the past, like a type of film, world that you would find in a film noir, but really a hybrid of the two and a kind of blending that uh, we proceeded to try and incorporate in the design of the movie. This is evidenced in, in almost every set where you have a kind of basic architecture that derives itself from an earlier period which has been overlaid many times with uh, texture and uh, is breaking down and the whole corruption and decay of the society is really being reflected in the kind of flaking and crumbling of the physical walls. This was found on the wall behind the Andrew Walker. I think that the reason that, that um, I wrote Seven is, is kind of twofold. One thing was I was working for a low-budget company at the time that was in a kind of exploitational mode of operation. And, and, um, and Seven, you could say, you know, Seven Deadly Sin Murders, it was like an easily digestible, you know, one-sentence idea. There are seven deadly sins, Captain. The other thing was that um, <clears throat> living in the city, there's certain things that you have to kind of ignore every day just to kind of get by. And, and if you think too much about it, you're not really going to function. And I think that that, to me, is what John Doe's about to a certain extent. He really, really cared beyond all reason. David Fincher. The library sequence was a source of much contention. The studio said, we don't need it. The movie isn't about Somerset. It's not, this is about, this is a one of those scenes that directors love to shoot and it's going to be a big, you know, it's going to be a big rigmarole, it's going to be expensive to do and it's just, it's all kind of this like bullshit ballet stuff and, and the audience doesn't need to see it and they don't care and uh, this is something that we could easily, you know, cut a couple hundred thousand dollars out of the... And I maintain that this was really, really important to see where Somerset goes to get away from all of this stuff. There, there is some, there's a place somewhere in the city that is his, you know, uh, sanctuary. Arthur Max. We were looking to find uh, in California a library that had the scale of the New York Public Library and with the same classical grace of architecture, but weren't able to. Um, Either they were too modern, or they were too small, or they didn't have a balcony, or for some reason weren't suitable. So we ended up choosing a disused bank building in downtown Los Angeles, which served very well as a library interior. The trouble with it was that it didn't have any books. So we then set out to design with uh, the help of a computer, choosing the, the lens angles and uh, determining the field of vision so that we would be able to construct the bookshelves and stacks to a degree that would give us a sense of scale but without going through the roof on the costs, uh, which we did. And we ended up building some tremendously high and uh, expansive stacks. The problem then became the fact that nobody in Los Angeles had enough books to fill these shelves available, 
And so they, we then proceeded to have to uh, create our own books, which we did by asking the set decorating department to make vacuum formed bookend molds and then paint and label them by hand. I think we ended up with something like over 45,000 alleged books. If you caught John Doe and you interrogated him, I don't think that you would find that he's a brilliant man. You would find that he's a poser. You would find that he is a, he's a person who's rationalized his zealotry and he's been able to do it because he's intelligent enough. You know, it's like... I didn't want him to be Hannibal Lecter. I didn't want him to be, you know... Uh, um, a mastermind. I mean, I think, I, I, I think the best description of Doe is that he's a really meticulous, unbelievably organized and patient and thorough. And I mean, those are the most frightening people. It's the people who aren't particularly brilliant, who latch on to ideas that validate their own uh, specific bent. You know, I mean, and that's what he does. He's a, he's a doer. He's an accomplisher. And, and what he accomplishes in this movie is killing seven people. Eight, actually. But I wouldn't want people to... I mean, there's no, there isn't really any high thinking going on. There's, there's high organizing. Andrew Walker. The research portion that Somerset's doing, looking into, like, mentions of the seven deadly sins in literature, arises from talking to a friend's father, Jack Silberg, who was a professor. The beauty and the pity is I'm so much more along the lines of intelligence of Mills. I mean, I would probably reach for the cliff notes before I, you know, made it through epic poetry. David Fincher. I love the light in the scene where Brad gets into the, the car across the street from the, the Biltmore Hotel. I think there's a couple of bounce cards and maybe a 12k just to eat into the window but I love the exposure just how real it feels it just doesn't feel like there's a film crew there and that's kind of was a rule of thumb is how do we do this with the least amount of fuss and one of the things that we found out that was sort of funny was when we were shooting you know we were really worried that that story point would be made that people would understand that he'd gotten cliff notes and of course we found that when we put it in front of a college audience that they were way ahead of us I mean they could see in the wide shot the the yellow and black stripes and they were cracking up before we even got to the inserts we probably didn't even need them I think when Mills go, comes in to take over Somerset's office there's there's a sense of of uh, the the feel of it is really uh the feel of the light is really uh, wonderful in that. It's so simple. It's just this kind of Rembrandt soft side light, and uh, and that's it. Just one direction. We have a little bit of a there's a little top fill in it, so it kind of um, you know when his head goes back when he leans back in the chair, and he kind of you know you get a little bit of this. It's a little colder, a kind of top light that comes into it. There's a real um, sculptural sense of the people so it's very three-dimensional you know it has a real uh and there's also a real luminous kind of quality to um to pitt's skin just like the edge light the way it catches him i really love that the look of that scene i think this is a scene actually where if you look at brad's hand when he's on the phone his left hand is like almost purple because it's broken or his fingers were sliced at this point he has stitches in them and he has a little special sharper image or Porsche Carrera of hand braces that Rob Bottin made him and it's like strapped around his wrist so tight he has no circulation in that hand so he's always putting it up and it was always blue he has no actual movement of that hand so that's why that hand is sort of always out of the way see I see it's more of a naivete with Mills than uh, actual stupidity with all this false bravado and, and tough Tough guy act. You see who wears the pants in the family. He's quite pussy whipped. It was very important to me. 
because of our ending, what 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 leads up? Because basically, we're, we're dealing with. I mean, he brought her there, to this city, to this world, to the dogs. Shoved them in this little apartment. Um, this was something she gave up for him. They decided to do this. I always felt, for him. This was going to be his little shot, and I. Because that's all we see, we don't we don't see it like the discussion beforehand about making the move and what was going to go on. It was very important to me that we that we knew that he absolutely loved her, you know. Otherwise, I thought it would uh, hurt everything we were building up to. We tried to imply that the Tracy character had just begun decorating, and but hadn't had very much time as they were still leaving out of boxes. So the curtains, the curtain rods, and the light fixtures themselves were basically the residue of the previous tenant who may have lived there for 30 or 40 years. In that way, we tried to kind of establish a kind of eclectic style to the movie, which we used throughout, where there was not really a definitive taste to anything. Oh, good dog. Come on, good dog. Oh, the dogs we added in rehearsal, one of the things that um, Brad and I talked about was just how unbelievably selfish Mills was, that he was he was really kind of playing this kind of weird game in his head. He was he was he was trying to sort of live out this serpico reality that you know, that isn't real. You know, he wanted to come to the big city and put the bad guys away and, and it was Brad's idea that he would have probably trans transplanted his uh, his three dogs to this tiny little apartment, and <laughs> you know we so we created this little room in the back that's just the floor is covered with newspapers and there's all kinds of dog toys and you know that's just a, another indication of of David Mills' kind of inability to see others or see the world as it really is. I love the way that the the after dinner conversation begins because it really does feel like they kind of finally hit the wall in conversation and they don't sort of know where to go next, you know. And Morgan has that great kind of he he was doing this thing with his hands where he was folding up napkins and like wrapping them around his wrists, like he was around his fist, like he was going to hit somebody, and he didn't want to leave any marks. And I was I remember looking through the camera and just going, "What is this? What is this behavior?" Again, I still don't know exactly if he's getting ready to deck Gwyneth or what exactly he's doing there. You know, Andy had written this scene that had this little, such a strange little joke in it, and and it just seemed so great. And and when we got to to kind of figuring out how we were going to engineer it, you know, it became obvious that we had to build a set off the floor so that this thing could be built on supports that could be rigged with motors that would shake literally every wall in the place. And um, it was really expensive and, and real, you know, it was like a real engineering job. It wasn't, you weren't just kind of manufacturing a, a facade. I mean, you really had to kind of build an apartment. The set was uh, built on a sound stage, a giant vibrating stage that they basically put a quarter in and it came on like a bed, you know. So we had some good laughs over that. I knew that the film did not want to deal with a lot of violence sort of head on, that we wanted to sort of catch things in kind of the periphery of our headlights. And, and one of the things that was that made it possible for us to edit the violence was that you would sort of see the violence one step removed. That is, you would see, you would hear people talking about it, or you would see photographs of the aftermath, or you'd see, you would ostensibly see photographs of photographs of the aftermath. So that by kind of putting these different, you know, layers of the onion in between us and the actual act, that I could still keep people's interest without having to to really you know, the black and white removed the shock of the red. The um, It also sort of made everything seem sort of real and kind of mundane, 
you know, sort of treated the murders in a very sort of, you know, this is not information that's being art directed for you. It's just recorded. And here it was, it was kind of clinical, it kind of dealt with the violence in a clinical fashion. And so I think that the, the photographs, although they're shocking to a lot of people and a lot of people find them to be, you know, really, really violent. I, you know, I think they are technically, you know, a really kind of restrained way of showing what, what happened. I'm just going to get another beer. I think Gary needs a drink. <laughs> and I, I like that little detail. It's like conscientious of Tracy, you know, uh, not to wake her up. That's what that was all about. He's preaching. Now, there was a scene in between that we wanted to shoot, actually. It was a scene uh, that Fincher had written. Mills says, thumb recall. And uh, it was basically this scene talking about how he wanted to uh, cut anyone's thumbs. Anyone who was committed for a crime, he wanted to cut their thumbs off. And you see, he brings him out, he asks for wine, and he brings him out a full glass like it's a Coca-Cola or something. Arthur Max. We were consciously trying to reproduce the quality of the Luca Sante book called Evidence, where he has a kind of loving relationship with crime scene photography. But we tried to do something of our own with it, in the sense that it wasn't just a reproduction of something exactly as we'd seen it, but it had a kind of flavor of it and uh, a smell of it, so that we could we could blend it in with, again, the contemporary city that we were forced to walk through and be in, in other sequences. We didn't want to make a period movie, and yet we looked a lot at period references to try and see what the mechanics of the, those kinds of images were. Never cry for help. Always David, no bless him, uh, made that scene very simple. First we, we shot it, uh, then he moved in, and it was, it was more about the pictures. Uh, the dialogue was more incidental. Uh, the germane part of the dialogue was at the end when he sees the woman with the eyes. And he said, hmm, this must mean something. The rest of it, you're just, you just, just, you just talking about St. Thomas Aquinas, about, you know, and showing his, his erudition, his, his learning. And, and of course, Morgan Freeman, uh, who used to read a lot, doesn't get to read much more than scripts these days, doesn't remember anything he reads. <laughs> so. And we start to get a sense of her loneliness, um, her not really wanting to be here, that she's done this for her partner. Now this was one of the scenes that I was not so crazy about in the script because uh, he was so earnest and I actually saw him a little more self-serving. And I actually, I wanted him to turn around to look at Mills. I mean, I wanted Mills to turn around and look at Somerset and with just to look like, a very insensitive look, like this woman's a, a nut job. We're not getting nothing from her. But uh, <laughs> Fincher thought it was extremely inappropriate. Or out of place, um, anything at all. But I do like the when he leans back and uh, Somerset uh, uh, tells him... There may be something we haven't seen. Well, I like you just start to see them working together a little bit and you see Mills starting to listen to Somerset and Somerset taking the time to teach David Fincher. This is my favorite master that I've ever shot. This whole scene played around these square, rectangular shapes. It's just amazing how much efficiency there was in where the camera was placed. I mean, you basically have two kind of overs, at Brad over the painting and at Morgan over the painting, and, and the rest is just some good acting. I like this little effect here, of walking in the frame, then walking out of the frame, then walking back in. This is us. Fincher line. Yeah. Fincher's quite funny. Quite cynical. 
There's an interesting story about Mario Di Donato, who's the uh, forensic, the fingerprint analysis guy who they call in. Mario came on the set. I had worked with him before in music videos and commercials. And uh, we liked the idea that he was, he's an East Coast boy. He has this definite New York vibe to him. And uh, he came on the set and he said to Morgan Freeman, you know, I've been a huge fan of yours ever since the Electric Company. Morgan sort of didn't know what to say. I think he thought that he was making some kind of a crack or something. And he was polite and said thank you and sort of moved away. And I don't think Morgan Freeman sort of ever realized how many people he reached. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I, there are studio executives out there who learn to read from Morgan Freeman. <laughs> when we were doing the electric company, the thing that got most in my way about it was doing the same thing over and over. It just drove me to distraction. Just drove me nuts. A nine-to-five job, five days a week, doing the same thing over and over and over. Boy, I might as well work in an office somewhere. Andrew Walker. A lot of the things that Morgan and Brad are talking about, like in this scene in the hallway, a lot of these things arise from interviews with real cops. Things like about the fact that unlike Quinn Martin production, cops aren't pulling their guns like every five minute. Cops very r rarely are firing their guns. That there's an incredible number of homicides that go unsolved. When you're trying to do things, uh, uh, when you're trying to do a movie about police work and you want, to, want it to be as close to authentic as authentic as possible, you really want to hold dynamics down to a minimum. And if it's let it die, let it just suffer in uh, in, uh, in lack of uh, in in low low energy. You know? So the lower you get, the higher you can end. Real police work is not Starsky and Hutch. You know, it's it's not uh, 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 even narcs. You know, constantly on the streets, running and shooting. You know, it's an awful lot of terrible coffee and just sitting around waiting for something to happen. Trying to build a case that will stand up in the court is, this guy is goes not easy. The name of and Real all of the cops who uh, detectives who are your technical advisors on the film, the first thing they'll tell you is that uh, and you can screw up so easy. And all the months of time you put in on a case can be just thrown out. Time in prison, it's because Actually, you're not paying mind, attention. My process is the process of limiting. It's the blinders that you put on it. So what I try to do is, instead of thinking of everything that I'm going to do, is try and figure out the rules to determine the things that I'm not going to do, or things that I'm not going to be able to do. Um, you know, I think it's... You have to embrace your limitations, not only as a as a individual, but also as a, you know, your budget. You know what what it, what it can do. What it. The sunlight coming through the car and the ride to Sloth was pure serendipity. The planets aligned, and I remember when we went back to the parking lot to reload film. And Darius turned to me and he said, "You know." That was the take, at least for that corner, because you're never going to get the sun to do that again and go behind his head and create this halo. Spun him like a top. Brad just happened to be peeking then, and Morgan was just... I think he was probably more appalled at how many takes we were shooting, but he had the appropriate look on his face. died right there. Right there. Christ, what was his fucking name? We really didn't have much money to make the movie. We had as much money as you could possibly justify spending on a piece of material like this. The style of the movie was informed by the limitations. You don't have cranes because they're too expensive, they take too much time, and they're a nightmare. So we're not going to do that. We're going to go handheld, we're going to be on a dolly, we'll be on long lenses. If it makes it feel like you're seeing something that's happening down the block, you know, when the guys go breaking into the sloth apartment. It was important to be away from them, to sort of see that as you would if you were walking down the street and all of a sudden the SWAT team pulled up and they started going into a building. It wasn't to be in the SWAT team. There's no interest in being in the SWAT team. The interest is in 
you as an outsider watching what it is that they do. The sloth location was kind of interesting. I had shot a Coca-Cola commercial there. I think Ridley had shot... There were sequences from Black Rain that were shot in the same building. It was really amazing. We, we wanted a really run-down, fucked-up, old, trashed building. And this was had this beautiful old peeling paint all over the place and it had this great kind of green color to it. And we thought green was a real kind of rotted, molding kind of color and, and so that would be good for sloth. This was one this was a truly miserable location to shoot in. It is it was cold, it was damp, you know, and, and, and Michael who plays sloth, you know, he had to I mean he was practically naked except for, you know, real thin layer of rubber on his on his legs uh, you know except for his bed sores he was completely uncovered and uh this was not a this was not a pleasant or fun experience shooting this sequence i think this is the set where we brought the uh image of the air freshener to a, into a new dimension the uh use of any commercial product has to be approved and cleared by the manufacturers so after approaching the uh pine tree uh, air freshener people who gave us their wholehearted cooperation. We uh, asked David how many he would like to have in the set. He said, how many do you have? And they kindly provided us with 2,000 samples. And he asked us to put them all up. You want to come take a look at this? Darius and Conrad Hall and I sort of sat down and said, this has got to go fast because we got to keep it up because otherwise we're going to get bored. We're going to get bogged down in here. It's not going to have any energy and the actors are going to be exhausted and this guy's going to freeze to death on this bed. And most of the time we're shooting around the sloth victim because he would be in makeup for 13 hours and then he would be put into a van and brought over from San Fernando Valley. And I think they brought him up the stairs on a stretcher or something and plopped him into the bed and wired him up. And then we had basically like two and a half hours to shoot him before his makeup just dissolved. It was all gelatin. We were scrambling. Rob Bottin. Uh, uh, what we're looking at here is uh, uh, Michael McKay's body, which has been, you know, augmented with prosthetics to bring the bones out uh, uh, to actually make him look thinner and whatnot. You know, there's clever shading placed around all of his own anatomy to make him look thinner. That's Michael McKay as he really looks without the makeup on. And, um, you know, uh, and he's wearing, uh, uh, you know, uh, gelatin blisters all over his body. And the uh, paint job is, uh, you know, very, very long, you know, oil, oil style painting done by Margaret Becerra and Tom Flouts, you know, and myself, you know, uh, to actually, uh, you know, give him the final effect. A lot of people that actually have seen Seven you know, have commented to me that, you know, they think that this is a, a mechanical effect in that, you know, a human being couldn't possibly look this way. Um, you know, so they're actually uh, very shocked when they find out this is an actor in makeup. I like this moment for, for other reasons, actually, on the day. You know, Morgan's very tough. You, you, you in, a, in a fair sense, but he's very tough. You, uh, you have to prove yourself, you know, to... Uh, to get any kind of respect, which uh, uh, I completely understand. I had to loop this scene. I was disappointed I had to loop. I always feel like you just lose a, a touch of what's going on with looping. But there was, we were shooting this, this series, this section, and uh, I was walking from the trailers, and I just heard uh, someone yell, Pit, and I look over, and it's, it's Somerset. It's, it's, I mean, it's uh, Morgan. And he says, uh, uh, he says, Pitt, I'm having a really good time. They piss me off. I like that. This is the hospital from Cobb. They addressed this movie, this hospital for Cobb. And we just went in and said, oh, it's perfect. And they said, well, they have only shot, they've only painted this hall. And said, That's fine, we'll just shoot in this hall. TV scene, if you ask me. Arthur Max. When it came to Morgan... Freeman's uh, set, the Somerset apartment building, I really uh, thought quite frequently of my grandmother's house, yeah. where she had um, the same kind of blistering radiators and accordion grills over the windows and this heavy 
kind of patina of time on the linoleum floors. And it really helped kind of generate a mood of frustration and lack of hope for the character to deal with these kind of heavy, thick brown colors and without any use of vivid colors in the palette. We were very restricted to earth tones and deep greens and on occasion we would use a kind of uh, maroon. But we tried to reserve the warm colors and particularly red for the blood in the movie. So if it was anything at all, it was a, a no color color movie. And that was very much uh, David's idea to restrict the use of color uh, as much as possible so that when you did use it, it had some impact. David Fincher. Gwyneth Paltrow was um, a last-minute addition. She's really disturbing in a lot of ways because she is, you know, she's 22 years old. And when you meet her, she's not 22 years old. I mean, she's she's not physically. I mean, she looks very young physically, but she's just she's an old soul. I mean, she's just so wise, and she's just so knowing and so confident and so calming you know um and i had seen flesh and bone and i thought she was 30 years old in this movie i thought i i, I had no idea how old she was and i said we I, I was talking with um with brad i said you know who would be perfect for this is gwyneth paltrow and he said yeah she's she she's fantastic yeah she would be great for this and i think arnold was very worried about her age We'd seen a lot of really, really talented women, and and I just didn't feel like making the decision until I had let I had at least met with, with Gwyneth. And she came in, <laughs> the door opened, and she came into Arnold Copelson's office, and Phyllis Carlisle was there, and and uh, Arnold, and they were sort of sitting around Stephen Brown, and um, she came in and she said she sat down and she sort of shook everybody's hand. And it's nice to me, and she said, you know, is there a bathroom? And Arnold said, yeah, there's a washroom right over there. And she got up and she left. And they all turned to me at the same time. said, she's perfect. <laughs> and the, the only thing that she had asked for is there, is there a bathroom? So we knew that she could say that line. We knew that she could ask where the bathroom was and she would be winning at doing it. It was very difficult to find the how concerned or how hurt or how much longing you know Somerset should have how much how much he should still feel and how much he should have already kind of given up you know and and it was a very tough thing to find that performance it was probably tougher for me than it was for Morgan because it was really you know it, I didn't want it to be maudlin I didn't want it to be um I want you know wanted to make sure that it, we didn't I don't want to tug people's heartstrings, you know. I, I, you know, I don't mind if they they're moved, but I but I don't want to actively. I don't want to reach for it, you know. And it was really tough. He was so, you know, he's so good. He's so effortless at that, you know, that you don't. His performance sneaks up on you. you you're not even quite sure that you've seen it, you know. And then you see it in dailies, and you go, "Oh my God!" You know, take three was amazing. Take five was amazing. Take six is amazing, you know, you kind of, you know, the real movie acting, in my estimation, is not something that, you know, sometimes you don't even see it. Sometimes it just, you know, it's a fastball and all you get is the, you just hear it. <laughs> it's just like the wind through your ears, you know, you just hear the little whoop and then the next day you see it and you go, my Lord. Of all the sets, the one I'm most pleased with would be the police station because it's really a weaving together of three different locations to be combined to give the illusion that it's one single building. The idea I had was to look at the vintage police stations of New York, which basically date from the turn of the century to before the war, and have a certain kind of neoclassic architectural style, which have been now painted over so many times that they've built up such a, a great degree of texture and layering. 
spot. We tried to find those kinds of buildings, which are to some extent available in Los Angeles, but no one building was the ideal building. So we ended up using the exterior of one uh, warehouse, which seemed to have the right character as a police precinct. The interior lobby was in fact a hotel, whereupon we built a sergeant's duty desk, which was based on very early New York City precinct desks, and then kind of updated slightly with some video technology. And the interior of the precinct itself, the bullpen, where all the detectives and Somerset's office and the captain's office were located, was a third location into which we built our precinct. And trying to choose those three and blend them together so that you got the feeling that it was all one place. I think we were fairly successful in doing that. Use it to plant fingerprints. Andrew Walker. Brad would improvise a lot of stuff. And that was one of the, the great things exactly. about it. Like, Worst of all, patient. He's a nutbag. And just because of the fucker's got a library card doesn't make him Yoda. I said to Fincher, would he really say that? And Fincher said, yeah, well, like the smartest guy that Mills can think of wouldn't be Einstein. It would be like Yoda. That's the smartest guy you can think of. And he's right. Come on. I think that the design of that precinct and the slightly outmoded equipment that they use, coupled with the very kind of dated style of the architecture, give you the impression that the police have too much to do to ever be able to deal with all the crime that's going on around them. Arthur Max just whipped this little set together. He's actually in the background. Arthur Max is the guy reading in the background when Brad's eating potato chips. Give me your truly money. evil, truly evil music. You're walking down Hollywood Boulevard and you know, you walk into these these uh, pizza by the slice places, or you go to, you know, the place to buy, uh, uh, you know, weird Hollywood memorabilia, like video printed pictures of yourself on a T-shirt with Lonnie Anderson or whatever. And there's always weird music playing in these places. There's always some blast from four and a half years ago, or or something that you remember from high school. There's always some strange piece of music in there that you just go, you know, where did this come from? And there's something Love great about Love Plus One that just kind of enveloped this weird back. moment of meeting the greasiest FBI guy yeah. in the world. The Brood. I think Morgan is truly one of our greats. By telling you this, though, He's the voice of Zeus. He didn't give me an inch of slack, which I, I got a kick out of. I wasn't getting away with anything. He was letting me know right from the beginning, you, you know, I, I don't care who you are, Mr. Hollywood, cheesy, sexy guy, you know, you're going to have to prove it. The guy... <laughs> Oh my goodness. The guy in the background who's cutting this was drunk. He's an extra who's just shit faced and he has a straight razor and the props department didn't have a fake straight razor and the guy who's playing the guy who's getting shaved by him was constantly coming up between takes and saying he was gonna get a stunt adjustment because the guy who was shaving his neck was so fucked up and had no business holding a straight razor. He drops the towel and everything. He's just, he's like the grandfather on the Munsters. He's just this insane old dude who's just gone. It's Mill's first little lesson that uh, uh, the world's not so black and white and doesn't operate as it should. That the good guys aren't so good. Maybe the bad guys aren't so bad. The Marquis de Chardet. The Marquis de Sade. Whatever. <laughs> The, Mar <laughs> the Marquis de Chardet came in, I think, uh, about our third script reading, the third day of we were reading through it. And we had just begun developing this, uh, this illiterate version of Mills, and, uh, which, which the script alludes to, but, uh, uh, and I, <laughs> I don't know where it came from, but we, we had a good laugh in it, and, uh, it really started us on uh, defining Mills, so we kept it. 
been talking to my wife. I just, I, just the way Somerset raps on the door, he kind of flips his knuckles back. He's so graceful, that guy. I, I, I love this again because it's so unconventional. We're not expecting it. And uh, Somerset spots a guy, and the guy starts to walk forward and pulls out his gun. The chase sequence for me was, when I first read it, I thought, I don't think I can do anything particularly interesting with this. You know, I kept sort of pushing the studio to give me some more money and some more time and some more, let me blow up a few helicopters or anything. You know, don't make me just do this because it's just a guy running through a building after another guy. And Brad and I started talking about it and he was never really afraid of it. When we started talking about that, when Brad kind of hit on, you know, I'm not going to do it like Bruce Willis. I'm not going to do it heroic. I'm going to do it like a guy who's really scared shitless. All of a sudden it put this spin on the whole thing for me, which made me say, well, then I'm going to, I'm going to shoot it in this building. I'm going to shoot it as fast as I can. I'm going to get me, you know, a little Aton 3, these little French handheld cameras, little documentary cameras, and I'm just gonna go running after you. I'm just gonna be right in front of you when I need to be in front of you and I wanna see your face, and the rest of the time I'm just gonna be running as fast as I can. That was the conceit. Again, those are the things that I look for in any given situation to try and limit my choices. I always liked the idea of, of uh, running through people's lives, you know, just taking a camera and running through a railroad apartment and seeing one person in one apartment was doing it, the next person, you know, it's the idea that kind of life goes on around your story. Your story's taking place. But there's this whole other thing. The ghosts at the Overlook Hotel and The Shining, are, they've got their own agenda. This is where the training with the, with the cops really came in handy. It's called a, a weaver stance, the way the gun is held. And the idea is that wherever the gun is, your eyes are, and vice versa. And that you're also keeping your body sideways in case you, you are, are being shot at, so they have less of a target. You know, we didn't have any money. We didn't have any time. We had three days in this hotel, and, and we had to go really fast. And and the immediacy of that, and, and the immediacy of what we were trying to do with Brad playing a guy who is terrified for his life, turning corners, looking for somebody who's trying to shoot him, kind of informed what it was that we could do. I don't know, it just, it, it feels like one of those cop films from the 70s, you know, it's kind of like the sheen on the black leather jacket and he's sweating and, and he's kind of got his head back and he's getting just these pools of hard light that come down onto his face and he's listening, the whole time he's listening to what's going on. We didn't approach it in a pristine way. You couldn't afford to do it in a pristine way. And it just had to have this kind of momentum. And so we just created this momentum as we were shooting it and just let that sort of, you know, infuse all the pictures. You know, that was the, that was the thing that sort of seeps into all the pictures is that we are really, really moving fast. And we're making real visceral decisions. You know, there's not a lot of intellectualizing going on. There's, It's a sloppy chase, it's messy, uh, it's confusing, it's frightening. Just exactly how I think it would, how it would go down. Now here you start to see the, the true love for the, for the French connection in, in these types of films of the 70s. That was one of our first conversations, Fincher and I, about uh, this love for the 70s films, and, like uh, French Connection and so forth. And, uh, and this one, the first times where I actually uh, saw the director pull off what he was talking about. Okay, I insisted that we run on top of the cars like an idiot in the rain. And so I go from the first to the second to second. And as I'm jumping to the third, I'm aiming for the trunk. And uh, I didn't go anywhere. The next thing I knew, I was just, I was sitting in the window. My ass was literally sitting on the, on the speakers. And it was like I was sitting in a bathtub, my arms and uh, feet hanging out. And uh, I thought, oh shit. And as I'm running down the sidewalk after getting out of the car, I go, you know what? Uh, I cut my hand. I, I think I hurt myself pretty good here. And, I'm, and I, I run about 30 feet longer than I normally did. And I stop and I look. And, you know, I have this huge slice um, at the webbing of my fingers. 
And I go back and I show Fincher and I say, well, uh, uh, my first response was, did you get that? Of course. And they didn't even get it, which was a shame. And then I show uh, Fincher the damage and he literally turns green. You can see the bones on three of his fingers just right where they meet it. This nice, soft, fleshy part of his hand. It's actually Fincher holding the gun here because uh, he had a very specific idea how he wanted the trigger to come back and no one could quite get it right. That whole alley was uh, sterilized because it was actually really a location that was frequented by uh, crack dealers and, and junkies and there were syringes everywhere and uh, rats infesting the garbage dumpsters. So that whole alleyway was steam cleaned and disinfected and then redressed with our own sterile syringes and sanitized garbage. Uh, we left out the rats. The scene was done on the sound stage. We recreated the hallway and uh, it was done right after the accident. So I had the full cast on and so therefore I had to keep it tucked in my shirt there so we couldn't see it. But I, I do like this scene because uh, you see their true uh, natures and you see them clash. See, what I like about Mills is that uh, he, he's just so impetuous. He just doesn't think. He just, he acts. And he, and he doesn't realize when he's uh, stepping on people's toes and, and uh, offending people going a little too far because he doesn't think much further than than uh, his world. And this is why, this is what I think leads up to the end, why the end pays off so big. This is what I most loved about Fincher and, and Darius. They created a world, you know, because the subject matter is very dark and, and uh, just, it's constantly raining. It's, it's constantly damp and dingy. Um, it just it, it kind of muted colors of this, more of a, a 70s feel. You know, our city is a character, even though it is generic to any city. It's also the kind of the, the forest of evil, you know, that's where evil lurks. We decided early on because the movie had to take place in such dark environments that we wanted to make sure that we had control over how much the audience would see, exactly how much the audience would see. And one of the things that we needed to make sure uh, strangely enough, was that the the print could get dark enough that it could get dark enough that things would disappear, and it's very that's a very difficult. It's far more difficult than it is to get things bright enough so that people can see what they are. It's more difficult in a way to control where shadows disappear into complete pitch blackness. And one of the things that I wanted to do was when I was sitting in the theater and the black surround around the screen, I and it was there. I wanted to. I didn't want to see a difference between Brad Pitt's black leather jacket and the black velvet at the, uh, you know, Galaxy 6. I wanted him to disappear into my world, for him to bleed off the screen and, and for the screen itself to, to um, you know, not be a window, not a safe window. I wanted us all to be in the same place, to be fighting on the same kind of turf. The process that was used in the in the release printing was called CCE, and it's a process that uh, Deluxe Laboratories has that is basically a re-silvering process. On each individual print, as they're being processed, you're going to be taking silver away from the parts of the film that have to be clear and you're going and that silver is going to just be there in the bath and then you're going to reroute that print right back through and bond this that same silver that's been lost back onto the black portion of the frame or the darker portions of the frame and in order for that to be controlled in some way you have to make what would be normally processed normally would be a very thin print or a very uh, washed out print so that at the same time you're getting this additional lower end black enhancement you're also starting by making a print that doesn't have as much color it's a more muted more pastel sort of sort of print 
This flashlight, this uh, blinking flashlight, was something that actually happened uh, when we did the first scene, Gluttony, and we couldn't get the flashlight to work. And then we decided we liked it, and we were going to use it in the scene, and then we couldn't get it to do it anymore. So we had had them rig it to do this, where it would cut in and out. The most frightening thing about serial killers is how in a world that's so crowded do people hunt other people and defy detection? How is it possible? You know, you sit there and you go, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer, like how fucking out of it were his neighbors that they didn't <laughs> say, you're running a saw at two o'clock in the morning. What's the deal, Jeff, you know? Arthur Max. We, we pulled references from wherever we, we could, and um, we thought of his, his mind as being so labyrinthine that there would be no particular limit to the kinds of imagery that we could use. We just looked for a kind of John Donis where we, where, wherever we could find it, whether it was in popular culture, pornography, uh, high renaissance engravings, uh, contemporary uh, photographs, and or magazines, almost anywhere. And people were going around almost having contests to see if they could find something that was more fetishistic and more compulsive, obsessive than anybody else could find. His library and the room that was his library came from the fact that he was a meticulous and obsessive journal keeper. And I believe we had 2,000 notebooks, which we had to age and color code and end label. This went on for several nights, having people working around the clock, doing this to get all of those ready. And the idea was that this character had an obsessive need to accumulate and to categorize and had a mysterious filing system that only he understood. And so there was chaos, but within that chaos we tried to give some kind of sense of order. And it was a difficult balance because if you weren't careful it looked too neat and didn't have the right feeling of the depraved side of his violent nature. And if it was too disorderly, it didn't kind of speak of the compulsive side of his obsessive nature. Okay, and I love this again. This is great writing. Just a huge surprise. We don't expect at all. The phone was originally right next door. And uh, it was just too easy for us to find. So we, uh, we shoved it. We wanted to have this confusing moment and uh, this real uh, mad dash, so we put it at the clear other end of the apartment and hidden. It's not like John Doe's got a lot of friends to call, you know? Hello? I admire you. I don't know how you found me, but imagine myself. Totally unprepared for the situation. I respect you law enforcement agents more every day. It was actually, it was Fincher on the other line when we, when we did it. And uh, that was added later, after we had shot the thing. That's the real cast there from the accident. I mean, it was a hodgepodge of sources and references. We looked at African ritual objects, um, parcels of chicken's feet. We looked at World War II concentration camp photographs. We looked at police crime scene records. We looked at anywhere we could find images of the unusually grotesque and bizarre presented in such a way that it would relate specifically to the stated obsessions in the script of the John Doe character rather than just randomly picking out horrible uh, degenerate imagery. It had to have some kind of idea that brought it home to the storyline, or else it was thrown out as a waste of space. But a great deal of material that was in the, that shop was uh, taken from 
people who actually manufacture and uh, produce and design fetish objects of metal and rubber. I mean, there was nothing invented specifically for that shop except for the actual uh, dildo that was used in the lust murder. That was carefully engineered, uh, deriving its uh, form from a, the biggest and most gr uh, hor horrifying hunting knife that we could find, and then experimenting with um, harnesses and uh, buckle and belt assemblies that were derived from Jean-Paul Gaultier jackets. The last crime scene was set in the basement of a sleazy nightclub. It was filmed in the basement of a sleazy nightclub. We put up a wall uh, over an existing wall and then painted a uh, mural, but uh, somehow the, the owners of that particular location didn't weren't that enthusiastic about the nature of our mural. Mills is way in over his head, and uh, it's not till midway in the film when he starts uh, uh, realizing this, and he starts listening to the Somerset character. Mills, uh, Mills just starts out completely naive, uh, very much an innocent, not knowing what he's getting into. You know, he has to get here, and uh, uh, quite excited about the uh, the brutality and, and and the, the gruesomeness that he's uh, witnessing. And then uh, by the time lust comes around, I think it really, little by little, it started to chip away at him. And by the time lust comes around, it, uh, uh, it's really, he's really starting to question, you know, why he's here, what he's here for, what he's doing. And John Doe, I mean, here's, I mean, it's been sick, sickness after sickness, but here we just get to the absolute sickness, you know, it's just, um, here we see the weariness starting to set in. I mean, I mean, truly, I mean, there it is right there, the, the absolute brutality of the world, you know. Stomach turning. It's such a horrendous image. I, I felt so bad for this, <laughs> this actor. And he did an amazing job, but I just uh, have to go through that. I, I did not envy him. The, the, the fucking gun was in my throat! Fuck! I love this shot because you see each man uh, sitting and, and uh, contemplating his own world, what's going on. Morgan Freeman. Yeah, I'm not sure that the bar scene survived intact. I don't think it did. He turns out to be well. What was there was uh, Somerset talking about how his father, at age 13, had given him a book on um, forensic pathology. He was actually hooked by pathology, forensics. That's what kind of detective he is. Uh, same kind of detective that uh, sitting in Poitiers playing in, in the heat of the night. He's a forensics expert. He looks for the he looks for minutiae around the body, fingernail filings, dirt, bits of blood, and stuff like that. So he has grown up with the idea of being a policeman, of being able to solve puzzles. Puzzles, not crime. Puzzles. They set it up early on that there was a little friction between these two characters because Mills is looking at Somerset as someone who's giving up the fight as opposed to retiring from a long and distinguished career. This is my second favorite scene of the film after uh, the, the Tracy Somerset scene. I don't think. Because uh, no one is right, each man has an opinion, and uh, I appreciate a scene where you see uh, two people coming with different views, but each each individual is right coming from where they're coming from, and uh, nothing is settled. But it's these kind of scenes you go and talk, and you know, over a cup of coffee afterwards. You only know what you know. 
You only know what you've been shown. You've o you only know what you've been taught. And uh, if if uh, so, however limited that is, you know, uh, that's what you get. Now, I I love the subtlety of this sequence here. The fact that we we come from lust and and uh, eventually it just uh, makes him want to be home, be home with the the one he loves, where it's safe, where it's warm. Um, He's very shaken at this point. And you see him start to appreciate her more, I feel. Or you feel like that's gonna happen, that could happen. Somerset's a man who has, I mean, look, no, aside from going to work, he has nothing. There's no bird, no goldfish, no dog, no cat. Nothing. He goes home to this apartment and he's wandering around in it with nothing to do, nothing to occupy himself with. And his anger and frustration is taken out. Throw the knife at a, at a board. And he's good at it. But so what? not a balanced knife the knife the knife expert says it can't be done morgan says i'll do it and he gets up and just walks up and puts a knife in the wall time after time after time what's your emergency david fincher's assistant rachel the lovely rachel playing the 911 operator one of them um this is a point where in writing where you've had a lot of sin murders take place and they're very horrifying and you, you, I think, have to question how much more are people going to take? How much more time can you spend on them? You know, there's a sort of short, shorthand, I think, that kicks in here where 911 picks up a phone and, and, he, and you hear John Doe say, I've done it again. And boom, you're inside a murder. And you notice we don't go, we don't take the long walk into the murder scene like we have at other times. It doesn't take as much time because there's less time, I think, now to be squandered. David Fincher. The screenplays are fun, funny things because they're invariably the things that you like about them are in a way kind of the gaps in logic and the rough edges and the leaps that characters kind of make. That is far more valuable than any kind of honing or, or planing or sanding that you can kind of do to make the thing smooth. That you invariably lose some of the human and tactile you know, living qualities that screenplays have. And I was convinced at the beginning that this was a script that really worked because it was a kind of three different ideas. It was a buddy movie and then it sort of jettisoned that idea and then it became this movie about tracking the serial killer and then it jettisoned that idea and it really became about how do the innocents and how do the experienced and how do the zealots deal with evil. Andrew Walker. John Doe here is probably coming from pride because I think he would have taken care of Tracy the minute Mills left the house. It's just something about that scene that it's so quick and it's just like I would assume that it would leave an audience like, wait, wait, wait a minute. The bad guy just turned himself in. It's over. But, but it's not. For the film student in me, John Doe lays down the floor, handcuffs on. He says, I want to speak to my lawyer. That's the end of the second act. This now is all third act. David Fincher. When Billy Hopkins and I first read Kevin, I think the only thing, the only question mark was whether or not we could afford him. You know, every, every, we knew that that was by far the, the, the truest um, version of that intelligence. And, and, you know, he just radiates that. So that was kind of the only question mark was, will we be lucky enough to be able to convince somebody to pay the money for him? I know, there's no way he would just turn himself in. It doesn't make any sense. It was kind of a, it was a tough thing because we didn't want to do the Hannibal Lecter thing. You know, we didn't want to do the, and, and that was obviously a real daunting um, consideration. But, you know, Spacey is so fearless. He's just, you know... 
He's just one of those guys who's like, truck? What truck? You know, he's kind of the Indiana Jones of character actors. My client says there are two more bodies, two more victims hidden away. I think there were we'll definite similarities between uh, the look of Alien 3 and, and, and 7, but they're both about... They're both movies about people, about characters who are fundamentally doomed, you know. So um, I can never make a movie like where you have a guy in a pickup truck with a machine gun shooting 50 bad guys that look like they're all at a Mad Max on, on motorcycles who are all chasing him. As much as an audience might want to see that, uh, to me, that's generic. And it's... And it's it's compromised, you know what I mean? It's, it's a, I've never seen that bad guy walking down the street. I've never seen that. I, my experience in life is that people have good and bad in them and that they're, and that, you know, the truly evil are usually are, are, are the people that people look up to. You know, the truly evil are people who remain you know, it's only through their actions, not through their words, that you begin to see how destructive and how, you know, I see generic violence and I think that it's wrong. You know, violence is in Shakespeare, violence is in Homer, violence, I'm not opposed to violence, I'm not opposed to the idea of solving situations through physicality or, 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 experiencing things viscerally seeing characters do things that we that we don't get a chance to do or we wouldn't do or we'd be too afraid to do or or we would never get involved in um but i have a real problem with the idea of saying well he's the bad guy so he deserves to be riddled with bullets he's the the good guy so he deserves to riddle this guy with bullets i don't buy that so for me I, if there's any similarity i think in or what i or what i was trying to do with the with my first film and and with seven it's that if there's one thing in in terms of my evolution as a as a as a voice it's that violence comes at a cost it costs people it's not something that you you don't get away with it John Doe's head splits open and the UFO should fly This out. was a scene that I never felt came together correctly. I, I, I think it's there, and uh, I think we lost it somewhere in the editing, actually. Amen, first accident. But it's, uh, it's like the calm before the storm, do you know? But uh, they both are aware the storm's coming, and it's unspoken, but it's there. I keep coming home late. My wife's gonna think something's up. It's also a scene where, uh, without saying it, there, or at least Mills is trying to say, you know, I, uh, you're all right. You know, I like that we don't know what he was gonna say because it, it, it could have been, I got a bad feeling about this, uh, or uh, we're gonna be heroes after this, or you're, you're a great guy, Somerset. We just don't have any idea. And I like this ritual of, of the flak jackets and the guns, putting the tie on. <laughs> yeah, the pre-tied ties was uh, another little Mills move that Finch and I got a good laugh over. And th no one else will ever appreciate, but Tracy had to tie his ties for him. This was pretty funny. When, when Brad gets into the car, he had his um, collar up. And then there was a, we had, for days after this, we had these debates on whether or not the collar up was too kind of groovy and whether we shouldn't do it at the end of the movie when he gets out of the car, should his collar be up? And we opted to uh, lose the collar up because it was just a little too, I don't know, Julio Iglesias. We had a little bit too much of that vibe. As they exit this city, the entire sequence is literally a, just a grab bag of of so many different units shooting so many different days and and you know we had like different helicopter pilots and different west cam operators and you know it was just like sending people out you've got to get me a shot where i see the car take the left you've got to get me you know um so it was just kind of this whole end sequence you know, it's kind of like making a Bond movie. You know, you have like the ski guys are out there. They're doing their ski stuff and 
somebody else is doing the pyro stuff of the uh, freighter exploding and you're sort of sitting in the editing room trying to make sense out of all this stuff and figure out where it's all going to go. Absolutely nothing. You need to stay on your left up here. When when we when we first started casting Doe, uh, Kevin came in and he did a reading. The original car scene was about twice as long as, as it is now, and he just kind of came in cold and read that thing pretty much exactly the way you see it in the in the movie, and so there wasn't a need to really direct him that much. It was. Uh, you know, Kevin's a real, he's hes real smart and he's real, and he's got a very sinister side to him, and he just carried that, he just, you know, walked in and did it, you know, there wasn't a lot of, we, we talked a lot about, more, more about how the information would be doled out, rearranging lines, uh, rearranging how he would, at what point he knew he had Brad, at what point he knew to let, you know, Morgan tell Brad that his wife is dead. You know, there was there was a lot of, we made a lot of little changes, a lot of little, you know, flip-flopping lines here and there. So it sort of came out more the way Kevin would do it. Space is very intelligent, and uh, it's that intelligence that, that makes Doe most frightening. It's really going to be something. This first section, the setup, was just, uh, um, I thought it was all coming out of uh, Mill's fear and not wanting to show his fear. So these, these little digs at uh, John Doe. Well, this, I mean, we shot this scene, and we shot the interior, we shot the, we shot Doe sort of uh, um, egging Mills on, and we shot them sort of leaving the city but we didn't really have anything to bridge the city and so that's why we used the, the factories and flying through the smokestack and then and then going over taking an off ramp and going over a, a, a freeway and then kind of out in the, in the desolate uh, landscape and so this was supposed to sort of bridge the, these two drive and talks this is really interesting writing to me because uh, I mean usually by now it's it's all down to chase and guns and uh, who's going to catch who. And instead, we, we slow down here for a conversation. A conversation with uh, the law and, uh, and the bad guy. Basically, we have a conversation with good and evil. It's very interesting to me. Spacey actually auditioned for this part before we started filming. And we shot this section near the end of the film, but... Uh, so we had several months to uh, to think about it, but the thing that he brought from from the initial reading, and the, the most important thing was that uh, uh, that you actually believed he was he was hurt by the conditions of the world, that he was uh, uh, from his point of view he was absolutely just in his actions, and uh, as the, as the scene goes along, you see you're, you you can't argue with him. Mills tries and loses. And uh, you're almost ready to sign up for his religion, aren't you? Is that supposed to be funny? We actually shot the scene in very little time, and uh, it is a long sequence for, for three guys in a box, but... But, uh... Spacey is so engaging. I mean, he's talking religion. And the best Mills can do is hang on, you know, he's grappling. To making money by lying. With every breath That's why we wanted Spacey, because he can speak with such conviction. <laughs> I mean, listen. I'm setting the example. I mean, you can't argue with it. it, it it's a perspective. Puzzled over. But it, it, it's, a, it's an honest perspective. And followed it. There was a, a religious background where Mills was coming from that it, it kind of shaped him. Uh, um, a religion where all the answers are basically pad answers and you don't argue with them, you, uh, and you accept them. And where things are much simpler, a little clearer cut. It's been this trip to this city and, uh, and this relationship with Somerset that's made him question these. To die until you felt like springing your trap? Tell me, what was the indisputable evidence? Spacey drilling it in. 
right before He's just I frightening. walk up to you and put my hands in the air. John. Now Mills can't hold on anymore because it becomes about ego. It becomes about saving face. Now here, I, I didn't want to. I didn't want it to appear too one-sided because I think there's an argument for every argument. So even though uh, though definitely slams Mills gets the best of him, uh, gets him to crack. We wanted to come around. We wanted just to have one point where he comes back around, and that's where uh, this that was actually done in a pickup shot with Fincher and I laughing in the trailer for about an hour, and that's where we came up with the uh, the uh, the movie of the week. Your your T-shirt at best. That's where we're headed. Yeah, I see what he's talking about. Right here. David Fincher. Originally in the script, they're just uh, there's a SWAT team over their heads who can we're supposed to be led to believe can help them out if something happens. And I, th when I got the location photos back and saw the high tension towers, thought to myself, it could be really interesting if the high tension lines are there, if Doe plans for this and he buries the bodies under the high tension lines or delivers the box to the high tension line, so that this would be a great way to show what a master criminal he is because the guys in the air won't be able to hear what's going on on the ground. And of course, when we got out to shoot it, we found that you know, we'd spent all this money and we were out there and we were flying around and none of the helicopters could hear what was the ADs were saying on the ground and we couldn't cue the actors and I think we ended up doing the whole thing with cellular phones. What I wanted to do, I wanted to shoot this whole sequence in Oakland, right by the airport, because that's probably, that's where I would figure I would hide a body if I was going to be out by the airport. But, um, you know, you can't shoot around LAX and you can't. So this just sort of seemed like they would go out to the, the desert to hide a body, or Doe would go out to the desert to hide a body. I hate shooting in sunlight. I just find it to be really, there's no control over it. You don't get to kind of sculpt anything. You're sort of, um, I think I was kind of going through from a, from a staging standpoint, kind of what Mills is going through at the end of this, where you're just being victimized by something that's way beyond your control. We just... We didn't have enough hours in the morning to be able to shoot all the shots that we needed looking one way. We didn't have all enough time at the end of the day. So we ended up shooting some stuff at noon and, you know, some of the helicopter shots are shot in the middle of the day. You can see their, sh their shadows are very uh, long in some shots and short in others. And sometimes the texture of the ground is really interesting. Sometimes it just looks really uh, terrible. But, you know, kind of... The tack that we took was, you know, nobody notices that the sea changes in jaws and that the sky is constantly changing. And one second, you know, Roy Scheider's close-ups are all sunlit. And the next wide shot of the boat, it's completely overcast. And we just had to barrel through all this stuff to get enough material to, to you know, have all the POVs and the cutaways. This was completely reactional filmmaking. I mean, you just literally had time to react to what was going on. We, we took a day to block everything through what everybody was going to do and then said, well, I need this piece and I need this piece and I need this piece and I need this piece. And it was just going as fast as you could and just making, you know, the most snap judgments that you could possibly make. Personally, I would love to have gone in and gotten rid of all the tire tracks in the, in the shrubs around the, 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 you know, the killing, the killing field where, where he shoots Doe. But, you know, we didn't have time to do any of that stuff. Arnold Kobelson expressly told me on our first meeting that this movie would never end with the wife's head in the box. Would never, that would, that I should just put that possibility out of my mind. And I remember telling everybody involved, it's going to take a few more weeks, but <laughs> don't, don't give up hope. We're going to do something. We're going to do something that's really pretty mean and pretty dirty at the end of this movie, and it, it will involve the head in the box. And I kind of couldn't figure out how to couch it for, for it may, may have even been months, but I remember finally going in and saying to Arnold, you know, in the year 2035, when no one knows who we are and no one remembers who Brad Pitt or Morgan Freeman are, you know, there's going to be a bunch of people sitting around a cocktail party talking about a movie that they saw on The Late Show when they were 15 years old. And that movie involved a scene in the middle of the desert with some guy delivering a woman's head in a box. And they're going to say, oh, 
the head in the box movie. Yeah, I love that. And I said, Arnold, this is how this movie will be remembered forever. When he said no head in the box, listen, I think he meant no bad ending, period. The first thing I did when I signed on to do this film was, was the agreement was, yes, I will do this film, but you cannot change the ending. Because I knew that that would be the first thing, just from now getting to have done a few jobs, that that was the first thing that was going to be changed. And sure enough, all even all along through the shoot, there was this roundabout effort, you know. But unfortunately, we had the deal, and that was the deal. The ending would not be changed. And um, the studio wanted to know whether or not something could happen at the end that would in some way thwart Doe. Doe didn't get what Doe wanted, but still, but still got killed. And so the only thing that was kind of set up was that he definitely wants Mills to take his life. So Andy and I sat down and we thought, well, if Somerset instead, when he realizes that he's not going to be able to talk Mills out of killing Doe, if he kills Doe before Mills can do it, that he would, by proxy, thwart Doe and possibly save Mills from knowing that he'd pulled the trigger and actually committed the the act himself. And that seemed to make a, a logical sense, and we were all sort of happy with that. And and I remember going into to into the read throughs to to read through that ending, and we kind of got to the end, and Brad said, "No way, I would. This guy would have been dead three pages ago. I would have shot him as soon as I knew. I would have been. I had unloaded this whole clip right into him. And so it was hard to, you know. I mean, I think everybody agreed. I think Morgan agreed. I think." Andy agreed that the that the the simplest tack to take would probably be the most effective. That we had to go with kind of what was the truth for that guy, and that guy is going to pull that trigger. The first rewrite we got was that uh, uh, Somerset kills him. Therefore, because uh, the studio or or the producers actually were were in fear that uh, John Doe gets his way, and. Uh, I was so opposed to that that I thought that was a cheat. Um, it's, the ending we have is everything we'd been building up to, and I, I think it's the most truthful because uh, um, one thing about life that's not understood is is, is uh, bad guys get their way sometimes, you know? Bad guys, now I'm talking like Mills. We had talked about another alternative ending, <laughs> which was completely laughable. That, the uh, producers had wanted one of the dog's heads to be in the box. So they thought it was too much, and uh, <laughs> we all laughed that one off very quickly. Give me your gun. What's going on over there? Although there was some placating that had to be done. Who was in the box? Because and we wanted the first thing just to be complete confusion here when he gets the news. Complete confusion, uh, disoriented. He wants you to shoot him. No! Went to denial. You tell me, you tell me that's not true. That's not true. Become vengeance, Dan. Oh, to right. disbelief, become wrath. Tell me she's alive! I mean, you just saw her that morning. It can't be. No! Just threw it all the way, you know? No! She begged for her life to take it. The idea of um, finding someone's head in a box whom you've met, whom you know. You have no sense memory. For anything approaching that. I had a very tough time with this. I wasn't... The way the baby thing is thrown in there, uh, it was just so many thoughts to, uh, to simulate that. Give me the gun, baby. Fincher put in a little flash of, of uh, Tracy. It's very nice. Now, there's just too much music here for me. I, you know, when we watched the dailies, it was completely silent, and there's something more frightening to me. But we were trying to make a date, and this thing was put together, this sequence at the last, at the very last. And uh, I, I really long for the silence. What I feel is most truthful is that uh, as far as the, d the development and uh, uh, demise, shall we say, of Mills, was it, that uh, 
that Mills's true sin is uh, is his ego, and um, because he wasn't paying attention, because he wasn't listening, because he wasn't looking, um, this is what happened, and maybe it could have been avoided. That's a big point to me. It's very, it's huge. Around the cause of the problem of the of the ending, the studio seemed to feel that there was some sort of um, cap or something needed to be added, which I frankly didn't, didn't and don't agree with. People often ask me, you know, so um, so now you're just going to do movies, right? You know, you're not going to do music videos or television commercials anymore. And um, I think that would be just such a waste of time to just do one thing. I mean, I think that the, the movies are by far more rewarding just in terms of a human experience. They're much more fulfilling. Uh, the the trickery involved in them is uh, for a much kind of greater purpose in a weird way. But um, but it's really f it's fun making television commercials and it's fun doing music videos. The thing that you learn in, from doing commercials is that you have to be, you learn to be specific. You learn to be, you learn to look at something with what is the goal. You, you, you're you constantly doing that because you've got 30 seconds. You know, um, you learn the discipline of saying, this is the reason that we are all here today. You learn to be able to define that for yourself. You're here today to make the donuts look good, or you're here today to make the tires look grabbier, you know. My feeling is, is that a music video, a music video is more like a song than it is like a movie. There's an abstraction. Music affords an abstraction. You have a bass line, and you have a drum beat, and you have the math. You have the bed of math. You have the graph paper on which you can draw anything. And then your melody line becomes this, it can be anything. It can go anywhere. It can do anything. It can, you can talk about anything. It's poetry. And that's what the pictures need to be in a music video. And they don't have to create a context for understanding because the context is MTV. That is the context for understanding. So anything can happen. I'm not that experienced in making movies. So I, I don't profess to actually know how they're done. I know how to direct scenes, and I know how to direct sequences. I know how to put that stuff together. To, to say that I could pre-visualize a two-hour movie is a lie. I, I don't have the attention span for it. I don't have the experience to be able to say, trust me, this will work here, and this will... I'm literally winging it. I think anybody who says that they aren't, I'd like to meet them. I definitely got sent seven because my agent knew that I was sick of happy endings and sick of things being tied up in nice, neat little bows. I have no interest in being the, you know, I don't, I don't want people to go, this, you know, this, you know, to read scripts and go, oh, this movie would be really great if it was really dark. That's an adventure, you know. I'm not really interested in in being the dark guy. I don't want to make a Doom trilogy. You know, it's not like my, <laughs> the next movie is going to be... Uh, I'm interested in a different kind of cinematic experience. I think that movies, if you feel something and if you are engaged intellectually and you see something in the people on screen that you recognize in yourself and what they're trying to do makes sense to you, then that's a good movie going experience. I think, it, you know, our responsibility is, to make, is bring people into the dark and make them feel something. And I don't think our responsibility is always to pander to this, to tying it up in a nice neat little package. You know, sometimes you can't just, you can't make it make sense. Um, it was a labyrinthine movie. It was a world within itself. It was our world, um, David's world. Um, David even wore a t-shirt one day that said, this is my world and you are just in it. And so it was a microcosm for us. And uh, 
I don't think it, I don't think it's trying to present a world that's believably real. It's not. We we twisted it and tortured it, and it's a, an allegorical realm. We twisted the uh, nature of things. Everything was slightly odd and off. Things didn't work so well and were breaking down. Maybe it's a world that we're going to.